So I'm going to start today with a story, and it's a true story. The murders started in 1993. A 62-year-old woman was brutally murdered in a pretty tourist town in Germany. A neighbor who had knocked on her door and got no answer phoned the police. When they arrived, they found Lise Lotte Schlenger dead, slumped over the kitchen table, strangled by a piece of wire taken from a bouquet of flowers in her sitting room. The police found the killer's DNA on a brightly colored teacup at the scene. Over the next decade, this killer struck again and again, becoming one of Germany's most prolific criminals, involved in human trafficking, dr drug crimes, murders, and burglaries. Her crimes baffled the investigators, never following a consistent pattern and scattered across three countries. Over 100 police officers joined the chase. She became known as the woman without a face. She murdered a policewoman in Heilbronn and became known as the Phantom of Heilbronn. The DNA strands found at all the crime scenes revealed her as female, and there were almost no eyewitness accounts. But the few descriptions they did have were of a man, suggesting they may be looking for a transsexual using various guises. The police put together a photo fit in an attempt to capture what the Phantom might look like. This is the Phantom. Finally, in 2002, the case took a turn. The body of an asylum seeker was found with the phantom's DNA. The investigators may finally have found the woman without a face. But the DNA test was repeated, and the results were not consistent. One investigator raised the alarm. Perhaps the tests had been contaminated. Over the next year, the whole mystery of the phantom unraveled. The police discovered that at the cotton factory where forensics teams bought their swabs, a particular woman who put the cotton tips on the little sticks had managed to contaminate several batches with her hair, skin, and saliva cells. The police had in fact been chasing the genetic shadow of this DNA worker around Germany for the last 15 years. And in the process, they had ignored more anecdotal, perhaps softer evidence, and the testimony that could have been found with the crime scene. The mystery of the phantom had been solved, and the person in the picture is merely hypothesized, not existing in fact. In the ancient world, oracles were consulted as perfect arbiters of truth, able to make prophetic predictions inspired by the gods. In the most famous oracle of all, the oracle at Delphi, when there are inconsistencies between events and the predictions made by the oracle, the oracle's power, its truth, its infallibility was never doubted, but rather it was dismissed as a failure to correctly interpret the oracle's proclamations. Science, data, the machines, we trust them as we trust an oracle. Sometimes we're so invested in the infallibility of science and technology that we stop thinking for ourselves. We can be dumbstruck in the face of this machine truth. We can be so dazzled by its power as to forget our own agency. It's a deeply human tendency to seek an authority that can give us all the answers, an omniscient guide that we can rely on to tell us what to do and how to do it. Plato, in his most, most famous texts, hypothesized a perfect leader, one that he called a philosopher king, that would perfectly know all truth and direct us appropriately that would manage a society and be perfectly just in their decisions. Today, we seem to have found that perfect guide in the form of machine truth arising from technology, from the vastness of data and the rational calculations of algorithms, a system that contains more information than any one person could possibly know. And it's easy to have a relationship of authority in relation to such hard data. We find it comfortable submitting to its authority. It's nameless, it's face faceless, and on the whole, it's reliable. And because these technologies arise from science, we tend to think of machine truth as dispassionate, as pure, uncolored reason. Now, my first love and my training is in political philosophy, but I've spent the last few years in science and technology. And the world of technology is very rich grounds indeed for a philosopher. Triggered by the theme of this year's Serpentine, I started looking into the history and the nature of miracles. So it seems that first there was magic, 
the inexplicable and the extraordinary. Early humans saw the world as a place of wonder. And then mainstream religious doctrine came along, and eventually magic came to be known as miracles. That is magic when the right god was pulling the magical strings. The rest of it was dismissed as occult and outlawed. As the Enlightenment took root in the West, science threatened to unseat God and the, as the force behind the miraculous. And now miracles happen every day. Our lives are more miraculous than ever. With medicine, the blind can see, the lame can walk. With fertilizer, we multiply the bounty of food a hundred times. With test tube babies, immaculate conception is an everyday occurrence. And technology, this special thing that emerged out of science, computers, the internet, the cloud, is utterly miraculous. It allows us to perceive the world and behave in ways that would otherwise be invisible and impossible. A trusted digital layer gives us possibilities of action that were once out of reach. Something as ordinary as satnav, glancing at a sheet of glass, a modern day oracle, we weave through unknown streets as though they were the back streets of your childhood. The oracle in our hand even tells us when there's traffic ahead. Each of us now has a digital double that opens up whole possibilities of action, like a digital voodoo doll sitting spread across all of the platforms that you use, that you've poured yourself into, the messages you've sent, the identification you've uploaded, your network of friends and colleagues, the identity online that you've amassed, this digital representation of you, this voodoo doll of sorts, is dematerialized, distributed, and eternal. And it's fed by our data trail every time we use technology. And we can do truly miraculous things with our data double. How miraculous that with Airbnb, I'm able to perceive an invisible truth, that across the road, there's a building with a person who wants to rent a room. And I also want to rent that room for precisely the amount that they're willing to rent it for. Our voodoo dolls interacting online, trusted by our connections and social networks, can choose each other to make the magic happen. And now with genetics, our voodoo doll becomes an ever more accurate representation than ever. In an absurd modern day ritual, a parallel of the ancients spitting into mud and molding voodoo dolls to ward off evil spirits, we now can spit into a vial send it to a genetics company and have our genetic code sequenced. Now I've tried this and it involves hacking up quite a lot of spit. And people sometimes do this in group spit parties. A wonderful image indeed. Decrypted by a genetics company, that genetic code is then consulted like an oracle to divine the deepest truths about ourselves. You can discover where are your ancestors from? What's the name of your sixth cousin living in Hull? Whether you like the taste of coriander, do you blush after you drink a couple of drinks? Which diseases are you likely to suffer from? Technology is miraculous, there's no doubt about that. And we can be so absorbed by this authority, by machine truth, by the ritual, that we sometimes forget ourselves. And I'm not just talking about big cases like the Phantom of Heilbronn. I'm also talking about people all over the world who follow their satnav and drive the car straight into a river or people turning sharply left into an icy lake or drifting into a wall thanks to the mistaken instructions of their machine on their dashboard. It happens on a fairly regular basis and the results are more embarrassment than anything else. But what happens when machine truth is at odds with my truth, when my voodoo doll takes on a life of its own? Like a friend of mine who stumbled upon his own Wikipedia page and realized it had the wrong date of birth, he tried to change it and was told that his source, that most true of sources, himself, was not a good enough reason to change the entry. <laughs> or what about when your voodoo doll is traded in the information economy, as often happens, an insurance company buying your genetic data, buying your digital identity, and sometimes like a pin pressed into a, into a voodoo doll, the real self feels the effects in our constrained choices like a woman denied life insurance in the US because of her genetic tendency for breast cancer. What happens when the voodoo doll gains sovereignty over me? Like the famous cases of so-called racist algorithms when search results are advertised, search results and advertising is filtered according to race and gender. 
Men are shown adverts for high-paying jo jobs many more times than women. Or the prison system algorithms assume that black men will reoffend and tailor their sentences to suit. The machine truth is powerful indeed. And I'm not here to say that it's a bad or a good thing. It can be either and it can be both. But I am saying that it is not neutral and it is not passive. By that I mean that technology is creative. It makes things happen that didn't happen before. And that's precisely what makes it useful and interesting, dangerous and powerful, mischievous and miraculous. <laughs>